Hey everyone, welcome to the video. I'm Pat and today we're going to take a look at why The Last Man. This is the first video in the What Went Wrong series where I analyze shows and movies that are regarded as bad and identify the main issues that led to their failure. And trust me, I know how easy it is to tear into someone else's work and nitpick it apart, but that is neither my goal nor my intention. I'm not trying to offend anybody and try to be as objective as I possibly can. I write stories myself and by analyzing these shows, I hope to improve my own storytelling skills. Always remember, this is only my own opinion and it's completely subjective. Feel free to disagree with anything I say. If you happen to like a show I dislike, there's nothing wrong with that. The reason why I picked Why The Last Man was because it was cancelled before it even finished airing the first season. That fact made me curious. Is the show actually that bad or are there other reasons at play? As of right now, the official reason given is that the network did not want to renew contracts. One could suspect though, after the development hell it went through of recasting, rewriting and reshooting, the show might have been doomed from the start. Since there are no official numbers regarding viewership, I wouldn't be inclined to believe that the show wasn't pulling in the expected audience, given its esteemed source material. Of course it's easy to just jump on the go vocal broke bandwagon and call it a day, but there's enough of that already, and it's neither constructive nor entertaining. Infos about the show Why The Last Man is a TV show based on the comic series by writer Brian K. Vaughan and artist Pia Guerra. During its run from 2003 to 2008, the comic has won many awards and accolades. It is one of my all-time favorite comic books and I highly recommend you pick it up and check it out for yourself if you haven't already. Before I begin, I want to mention that in this video, I recap the show. In the second part, I give a more detailed view of the show's flaws and our shortcomings, what I had personally changed and how. This video is also not meant to simply highlight the differences between the source material and the adaptation, but I will be comparing them on occasion to illustrate my points. The basic premise and main plots. The world was hit by a plague. Each and every mammal with a Y chromosome dies instantly, except for two individuals, Yorick Brown and his pet monkey Ampersand. The story follows their journey as they take the first steps to uncover the mystery of this plague. They are accompanied on their journey by 355, a secret agent and Yorick's protector, and Dr. Allison Mann, a scientist tasked with finding a cure for the plague. Let's identify the main plot lines. There are three in total. Yorick Brown, 355, and Dr. Mann's journey. The Amazons plot with Hero Brown, Sam, Nora, and Roxanne. And lastly, the governmental power struggle involving Jennifer Brown, the former president's daughter Kimberly, and the actual president Regina Oliver. There are also subplots involving the Koopa Ring and 355's past, which are interesting to say the least, but aren't really fleshed out or detrimental to the plot in the first season. There's also a second open-ended plot involving Jennifer's assistant and Kimberly, but this one to me is neither particularly interesting nor does it lead anywhere. These two plots are original and unresolved, therefore I won't be focusing on them too much. The main plot centers around the journey of Yorick Brown at 355. It starts off with 355, a secret agent working for the Culpa Ring, being reassigned to guard the president one day before the plague hits. When the plague hits, Jennifer Brown, Yorick's mother, becomes president. She orders 355 to find her daughter, Hero, in New York. You answer to the president. Yes, ma'am. Then find my daughter. When searching for a hero, 355 stumbles upon Yorick by chance. She returns to the Pentagon and reunites him with his mother. At the Pentagon, they look up information on a geneticist and find one in Boston, Dr. Allison Mann. Yorick must leave the Pentagon and meet Dr. Mann so he can be examined by her. He isn't safe here. The more people who know about him, the more danger he's in. There's a scientist at Harvard. She's the most qualified for the job. We have to get him to her. With only the president, her assistant, and two pilots knowing of Yorick's existence, the pair and the two pilots venture out to Boston in stolen helicopters. During the flight, 355 gets rid of the pilots who know of Yorick's existence. Yorick and 355 abandon the helicopter they're traveling in and dismantle it to trade its parts on the mark. Meanwhile, the government dispatches agents to investigate the crash site. There is tracking software in those birds. Yorick and 355 have several altercations along the way, where on one occasion he is seen. They steal a motorcycle and eventually reach Boston. They search for and find Dr. Matt. Her lab has been burnt down. Dr. Allison Mann? Do you mind? The only lab that has what I need is in San Francisco. Now they must journey across the US to her backup lab in San Francisco. Meanwhile, the government suspects foul play involving the stolen helicopters and sends soldiers to apprehend 355. You seen this woman? They immediately catch up and chase the gang down. Small rant here, honestly, the writers should have focused on the agent's investigation and them steadily closing in to build up tension and suspense. More on that in part 2. Dr. Mann and Yorick betray 355. They're after her, not us. The gang escapes their pursuers while they're holed up in the church. What the fuck? I just betrayed her because you convinced me no, to. No, I'm convinced is strong. I would say I floated the idea. After a short bout with the agents, 355 beats them soundly and they let them go. 
Does she get a real look? No, 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 no. She takes up the reins in the group again, and they continue their journey to San Francisco. I'm not gonna tell you how to run your fucking lab. So until we get to San Francisco, this is my show. We didn't have any I wasn't idea. talking to you. They promptly have a car accident. The trio is rescued by denizens inhabiting a village called Mariswell, who then proceed to incarcerate them. After they're released, the group stays in the village for the time being, so 355 can recuperate from her head injuries. For now, their story concludes here. It continues in the season finale in Marisville, which I recapped separately at the end. My initial impressions. The story is well adapted for the most part. The objectives are clear throughout the story. It's easy to follow along and entertaining to watch. The plot makes sense and the pacing is good. Characters involved have motives and fulfill a purpose. There are a handful of scenes that are obsolete or nonsensical, but overall the story flows well and is enjoyable to watch. For a more in-depth analysis, check part 2. Let's move on to the next plotline, the Amazons. It involves Hero, Sam, Nora and Roxy. Before we begin, I need to address the fact that Nora, Sam and Roxy are original characters created for the show. Here is where we get the first glimpse of the bad writing that plagues the show. I do want to mention that I appreciate how the show attempted to give the one-dimensional Amazons from the original comic more depth, but unfortunately, it's still a badly cobbled together story. But let's take it from the top. Hero, Yorick's sister, after killing her married boyfriend and giving his wife closure regarding his death and their affair, forages for resources with her group of transgender friends. The group leaves Sam and Hero behind, and Sam reasonably asks Hero to journey to DC to talk to her mother, the current president. Please, I just want to find your mom. They make it to somewhere in Pennsylvania, I believe, where they encounter Nora and her injured daughter in a supermarket. Nora used to work for the former president. I, I have White House credentials. I worked for the president. I need you to step back. After being turned down at the Pentagon gates, she returns to her friends who leave her. Back at home, Nora's daughter injures herself. After that, they drive off in search of food and shelter. They encounter Sam and Hero at a ransacked supermarket. They stay together and here is where Nora's and Hero's storylines merge. Right off the bat, I gotta say, this wasn't a good idea. Hero's original character purpose is to be the villain. That purpose was split up into two people. That's not a good thing. Because now you have two characters occupying the same purpose at the same time. Actually, three. But let me explain. Think of it as when forming a group of three main characters in a story, you commonly have a leader type, a brainy type and a brawny type. That ensures that the characters have different specialties to set them apart from each other, while also ensuring the opportunity to have different opinions and conflicts within the group. If two characters occupy the same role, one character will always be obsolete. The only way to remedy this is by making their ideologies and views waver as needed, which in turn leads to inconsistent characters. Anyway, back to the plot. Gun-toting Amazons burst into the house they're staying in and threaten the group. Once Nora reveals that Hero has medical knowledge, She's hurt, right? Your friend. She's a doctor. They have an awkward interaction. Choosing to be a man. I didn't choose, I am a man. All the men are dead, sweetie. Hey, fuck you. Okay. Take them to their hideout, a supermarket where their injured friend is suffering. Shortly thereafter, they meet their leader, a deranged woman named Roxy. Through flashbacks, we learn that Roxy used to work at the supermarket, had a shitty boss, cancer, and overall shitty life. You know what you want me to tell you? You want to be in charge? Go work somewhere else. She stumbled upon the Amazons, a group of domestic abuse victims, by chance. After a ploy to frighten the victims, she manages to persuade them into joining her. You can't stay here, it's not safe. From here on out, it gets kinda weird. The victims join her and start abusing each other. Also, weirdly enough, a good portion of the group are children. I watch the kids. She turns down people who come to the supermarket without any particular reason, and nobody questions that. Just take her. There's nothing we can do for you here. She does accept Nora, Hero and Sam, although Sam's not really welcome. They're supposed to hate the patriarchy and stuff, but they also kinda don't, until later. They keep talking about how terrible men are. Okay, but everybody likes you. So which is it? No, honestly, it's fucking confusing. For the most part, they just party. This is... It's a fucking party. Sam feels uncomfortable being there while Hero takes a liking to their deranged cult. She leaves and the Amazons let him. In my honest opinion, the Amazon should have killed him, either with Hero watching or forcing her to do it or literally done anything to kickstart this plot. Killing him would have realistically established their intentions to rid the world of the dreaded patriarchy. Nora feels uncomfortable as well but stays there for her daughter's sake. Eventually Nora's fed up and burns everything to the ground. She blackmails Roxy with questionable evidence into a sort of partnership. I'm in the inner circle from now on. You run things by me. The only thing that will keep you safe out there is numbers. You don't need the building. You need the people. But to keep them, 
You're gonna need more than men suck. You need me. I know how to get them to stay. This is an opportunity to take what we deserve. We are warrior women, daughters of the Amazons, and this is our world now! And now, with everything gone, the group is forced to raid other groups, and the group members have no qualms about it. I'm sorry, but I must interject here. Burning down their shelter and supplies was a terrible move. I understand the motivation behind it. Once the supplies are gone, so is the group, and then Nora can show her usefulness or potential or whatever you want to call it by uniting the group. But this is asinine. It doesn't matter how good of a speaker Nora thinks she is, in reality, the group would have fallen apart right then and there. Their differing opinions on how to go about survival would have split them up for sure, especially considering they have children with them. Anyway, moving on. The group stays and raids together. Daughters of the Amazons, take what's yours! When they go out and raid, they randomly smash up everything of value and importance. At this point, the Amazons have completely fallen off the tracks. I guess they were trying to villainize the Amazons, but it's just unbelievable and ridiculous at this point. The show attempted to give the Amazons more depth, but really only managed to tell an oddly disjointed story that needed to fit the preset narrative at the end. During the raid, they find out about the nearby village with electricity, which also supposedly harbors a man. A talent with electricity! Why well, am? He's nearby. This is where the Amazon plot ends before the final climax in Mars War. First impression, the Amazons were bad villains in the original comic and have remained bad villains in the show. But the Amazons in the comic served a purpose. They were the primary antagonistic force and actively chased the Auric. Whereas because of their late introduction in the show, their role in the story had to be taken up by other characters. And that is why their transition into main villains at the end is rushed and random. Their desire to kill man and eradicate the patriarchy isn't really explained or explored. In this plot, the characters and their development are particularly bad. Hero is mostly sidelined because of Nora. Sam provides nothing but to be a love interest throughout the season. As mentioned before, Nora and Hero have far too similar ideologies. Neither of them hates men, and to an extent, both are on board with Roxy's crazy behavior. A quick fix to the plot would have been Hero and Roxy have the same goal, but opposing views on how to achieve them. And lastly, we've come to my least favorite of the plots, the government plot. The plot centers around Jennifer Brown and her endeavor to keep Yorick's existence hidden and trying to stay in power by thwarting the Republicans' attempt to rightfully succeed. But Regina Oliver has a legitimate claim to the presidency. Jesus wasn't vaccinated? Is that real? It would take weeks to get her up to speed. We don't have weeks. But she can't be president. No, she can't. That's when it becomes abundantly clear that the show is hung up on gender identity and politics rather than telling an interesting story. It's truly a shame given the source material, but I'm getting ahead of myself. I knew from watching the show that there wasn't much to the government plot to begin with, but only when I started summarizing it did I realize how little there is besides Democrats and Republicans hissing whale threats at each other. You rhino. Oh, grow up. While there are key moments early on in the show where the government, more specifically Jennifer Brown, is involved, I will not attribute them to the government plot because they overlap with the main plot. Without further ado, let's dive into it. The plot starts off with a presidential party where unimportant people chatter with each other. Then, on the next day, the plague hits. Despite the calamity of biblical proportions causing the collapse of modern civilization, some people hold on to conspiracy theories while camping outside the Pentagon whilst others storm the White House. Right off the bat, the whole plot feels like random OS events on the, of the recent years, capital riots, BLM protests, pandemic conspiracies, and so on, were shoehorned into the show for no particular reason, literally. A lot of tear gas, haven't seen any rioters yet. What do they want? Attention? A time machine? I don't know. I'm very sad to see the IP being dragged down like that. I don't know if the original creators signed off on this or not, but pushing your political views into the show is often a surefire way to alienate a vast audience. Anyway, moving on. Jennifer Brown is the president. She orders Agent 355 to, to find Hero, but returns with Yorick instead. His mother hides his existence for safety reasons for the time being. On one occasion, Yorick chases Ampersand through the Pentagon and is seen by the mentally unstable previous president's wife. Jennifer and 355 convince her that she just saw an illusion. There's a man here. It's all clear, ma'am. There's no one here. Jennifer and 355 decide to task a geneticist in Boston to examine Yorick. We need a geneticist. I can get him out of here. 355 and Yorick steal two helicopters and leave for Boston. After that, it's revealed that the true successor to the president, Regina Oliver, is injured but still alive in Israel. I am the president of the United States. A power struggle between Jennifer, the Democrat, and Kimberly and Regina, the Republicans, ensues. This bickering just goes on and on without a resolution. 
The government dispatches agents to apprehend 355. The agents return having seen Yorick and report. Did she see you? No, she didn't see me. Six feet tall with a monkey on his shoulder? You made me think I was crazy. The unstable first lady commits suicide. Jennifer's inner circle doesn't trust her anymore after she betrayed them. They make Regina Oliver president. Beth, Yorick's girlfriend, appears out of nowhere. They invite her in and tell her detailed security information. They're asking for you in the war room. Can I come with you? Secret service is at a quarter capacity. Some of these women are brand new. We have to barricade the subway entrance. Could somebody get in? Better not to think about it. In a bad plot twist, she relays the information to the anarchist group she's a part of. The anarchists storm the building and shoot President Regina Oliver in the process. Jennifer, Sam and Beth flee and are abducted by the Cooper Ring. Kimberly and the pregnant assistant flee. Here's the issue. If you remove the government plot after 355 and Yorick leave the Pentagon, how would that impact the overall story? I'll tell you how. There'd be one less encounter for them, but aside from that, absolutely nothing changes. The government plot has no bearing on anything. Not one character involved in this plotline pursues a meaningful goal. The comics barely spend any time with the government, except for one short-lived raid by wives of representatives who wish to take over the seats of their deceased husbands in the Senate. And although the government is barely involved in the original story, it's more impactful on the story because there's a mysterious traitor within the government who seeks the Israeli army on Yorick in the hopes of capturing him. This adds another threat to Yorick, and is also his next big enemy in the comics. Arguably, an altered version of that event exists with the agents being dispatched to as Apprehend 355, but the main purpose of that is to reveal that Yorick is alive and expose Jennifer Brown's treachery. The government serves no purpose in the show, literally. Most communities that are shown in the show are self-sufficient and independent from the government. Yorick is sad when he's told about the murder of the president, who wasn't his mother at that time, which he doesn't know, but that's all that happens after the government falls. Granted, the fall of the government could have played a major role in the cancelled second season, but that'd be undeserved because they failed to establish why the government is important in the first place. For me personally, deviating from the comics to emphasize political bickering was the wrong choice and the worst direction to take the series in. Some people might enjoy it, but I'm definitely not among them. Since the open-ended subplots stemming from the government plotline are original, Beth, Sam and Jennifer's abduction and the assistant's pregnancy, I can't judge them justly. And therefore, I won't. They could be great or they could be utter trash. I won't go into detail in this video, but one way to make the fall of the government more meaningful if they had actively supported Yorick and 355 on their journey to Boston by providing safe passage through military camps and supplying them. That way being cut off from Jennifer Brown would have been an actual detriment to the success of their mission. And by moving the fall of the government further up in the story, specifically after reaching Boston and finding Dr. Mann, it could have given Dr. Mann and 355 a dilemma and the chance to argue about how to proceed, return to the Pentagon and save the president or to continue on to San Francisco. This would have presented a more organic conflict within the group. Dr. Mann and Yorick could have still run off together, been pursued and saved by 355 without the government having to dispatch agents to track them down, but instead leak in on Yorick which could have started an interesting manhunt subplot to raise the stakes and create tension. Let's recap. The government plot has too much pointless bickering. Also, at no point in the story has anything happening in the government, any influence on the main story. The finale is supposed to be a tension-filled highlight of the season where the plots finally converge, but it's anything but that, it's quite the opposite, everything breaks apart. The Amazons attack the settlement head-on and won't Yorick dead. Yorick runs away, Hero unknowingly chases after him. She catches up to him and spares his life of course, since she has literally no reason to kill him. <laughs> Meanwhile, Nora stops the raid and then the Amazons leave. They just leave. What's more, the Marisville prisoners let them leave. They also let them keep their guns. This doesn't make a lick of sense. This entire raid was utterly pointless. The sole reason this random encounter happens is because it's in the comics and therefore has to be wedged in there somewhere, somehow, into the show. In the comics, it's way more dramatic, with the showdown between Yorick and Hero, brother versus sister. In the show, it just gets cut short and ends. 
terrible, what an utter disappointment. Also, Nora kills Roxy. Seems legit. Overall impressions. Initially, I gave the show a 5 out of 10, but after rewatching the show and noticing some details, I had to drop the score to a 3 out of 10. If you enjoyed the show, that's fine. If you didn't, it ain't hard to see why either. The main issues are, it's abysmally slow paced, especially the first 3 episodes. There's far too much meaningless dialogue throughout the show, further slowing down the pace. Newly added characters are mostly pointless, some characters are literal caricatures of existing people, and of course, the show pushes a political agenda. Personally, what bothers me the most are the motivations, or rather, the lack thereof. If you want to make Republicans evil, that's fine with me. You just have to make sure they have an evil agenda instead of regurgitating Republicans are bad because the showrunners don't like them. The following is a compilation I made of the stupidest reasons given for character motivations in the show. That I have no regard for anyone's life uh, but my own. That I'm selfish and self-destructive and cruel. What do they want? Attention? A time machine? I don't know. Answers? I'll get in line. What's so special about Harvard? Somebody in Washington wants to protect them, so they want to burn them down. You want real change? There is no government without these people! In my rewrite video, I go more in depth about the show's flaws regarding story structure, character arcs, world building, and so on, and how one can improve on them. If that's something that interests you, make sure to check out part 2 of this video. If you liked this video, leave a like. If you want to see more, subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching, until next time, and have a nice day.